Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on a day where we just get to come and worship and be in the presence of God. And it is a joy to be able to do that with you this morning. And we welcome those of you who are watching online as well. Well, we have been in a series on the Psalms of Ascent, which is the Psalms where the people would sing as they would gather in Jerusalem. It was the coming together of God's people for the worship of his name. And they would sing these psalms on the way to the festivals as well as while they were there. And so these are psalms that help us to see uh, really how life unfolds and how it um, kind of has some high sides and some low sides in everything in between that we have to deal with in our life. And sometimes we can get focused on the harder realities of life and forget to celebrate and to cherish the blessings that the Lord has given us. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. I decided I'm going to ask you to share this morning. And what I want to invite you to do is to consider this question. When is a moment in time where you saw the Lord provide? Maybe it was in your life, or maybe it was in the life of a friend or someone who is close to you, and it could be something simple. It could be just having healthy relationships with people around you, within your own family. It could be that you offered up a prayer to the Lord, and you're just grateful that he provided by answering a yes to that prayer request. Or maybe it's something as uh, simple as a new opportunity that you're looking forward to. Whatever the case, I want to give you about a minute to share with the people around you how have you seen the Lord provide in the recent days. Go ahead and share with one another. Isn't it so appropriate for murmurs of God's provision to be echoed in his house? <laughs> Thank you for indulging me for a minute there. I, I think there's just times in our life where we have to stop and recognize what God has done and just say, Thank you, Lord, for your provision. And I want to invite you to join me in that as well. Would you just say this line with me? Thank you, Lord, for your provision. There's so many times we get hung up on the struggles of life that we just need to stop and remember that he is faithful, that he is the great provider, that he goes before us and he does all kinds of work in blessing our lives and he blesses us so that we can be a blessing to those around us. The blessings of our lives sometimes appear to come from our own hand, but the reality is I don't even own the air that I breathe. It all belongs to him. He has enabled me to do whatever it is I have done. And so, since I know that God has richly blessed me, I can then freely enter into generously blessing those around me. I can then freely respond to him by aiming to bless his name because I get to live this life of blessing that he has given me. And that's really what we're entering into today. We're practicing this heart of gratitude because Sometimes we get a little self-focused. Sometimes we take credit for the good in our lives, and that, that can be true. There's, there's a measure of when, in which we have to be disciplined, we have to take the right steps in order to see some of the blessings come out. But we need to remind ourselves that all blessings come from God, that he is the great 
provider. So as we turn to Psalm 126, I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, uh, feel free to pull out an app on your phone. But what we want to do is recognize that this psalm identifies God's faithfulness while being honest about the ebb and flow of life, that God significantly provided for the people of Israel, and they want to celebrate it and celebrate it well. And at the same time, there's areas of life where we're just asking that God would provide further. We recognize that life isn't fulfilled, life isn't perfect, that we still have more needs that haven't been met yet. And so this is going to kind of do a little bit of a dance um, from one side to the other. But before we enter into it, would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the chance that we have to come and to study your word. And we just pray that this would be a great time together in your presence and that you would just reveal to us how we can move closer to you today, how we can elevate your name and give you the praise and the glory that you are worthy of. So we commit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Starting in verse 1, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. For the second psalm in a row, we're looking at a post-exilic psalm, meaning that this happens after the Babylonian captivity, and Israel is now back in the land, and we learn from some of the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah that God had told the people before the captivity ever took place, before Babylon ever conquered Israel, what was going to happen, and they knew that if they didn't turn from their wickedness, if they didn't stop defiling the promised land with their behavior, that the Lord was going to take them out of the land. But they also knew that if God took them out of the land, that there was a promise to follow, that there would be a restoration, that he would bring them out of captivity and back to the promised land. And now that they're back, the psalm is reflecting on the way that the Lord did all of this, that even though he took them out into captivity and it was so hard, it was so traumatic, there were so many Uh, times of just feeling like you're down in the dumps, out in the wilderness with no help at all, they still see how God kept his promise, how God was restoring his people to himself and how he was restoring the inheritance that he once gave them to them again. And so in the return to Israel, we see the rebuilding of the city, we see the rebuilding of the walls and the temple, and as it all comes together, it's, it's like these unexplainable movements forward. Because, again, we talked about this last week, that there was tension among the people, that everything wasn't perfect, and that there was some great opposition. But yet, it was almost like this chaotic dream where, where there's hard things happening here, there's hard things happening here, and in the end, it all comes together and lands exactly where it's supposed to land. And there's really no good explanation for it. In 2019, Laura and I were able to buy our first home, and we bought it over on the bluff edge because we wanted the view that it would provide us with. And let's just say we took on a project, and we knew it was going to be a project, and we sat down and made a plan of attack, and it was a 12-year plan. Slow and steady wins the race, right? And so for me, this felt a little bit daunting. Uh, Though I was excited to start, though I was confident in uh, my craftsmanship, I I felt the stress and the anxiety of what it would be like to live in a home that's constantly being renovated. And as I do different projects around the house, I'll I'll get into some of these projects, and I know some of you are going to resonate with this. There's times when projects just need to be done, right? Like, you've gone to the, the hardware store at least 15, 16 times, 
and you still have one more piece that you need, right? You're tired, you're frustrated, it's taken way longer than you anticipated, and you have just found one problem after another. But suddenly you come to the point where you realize it's almost done. The project that you're working on is nearing completion, and once you do these couple little things, all that's left to do is clean up. And it's almost like there's this moment of breakthrough where all of the burden just starts to slide off, and there's this freedom that comes in. And isn't that true of our life in general, that we experience these times of tension where we're simply struggling. We're going in and we're kind of grinding through life, taking one step after another, trying to get through, and we're not really sure how. It's kind of like a chaotic dream that suddenly it all comes together and you come to the end and the tension, the anxiety, the stress is given. It's like you've broken through a wall and you no longer have to deal with the anxiety that was there. It's this just oh, deep sigh of relief as you go, I can use the bathroom again, <laughs> right? That heavyweight just slides off, and this is what our author is talking about in verse 1. He says, when the Lord restored the fortunes to Zion, you better bet that the Israelites did a whole lot of hard work. Blood, sweat, and tears went into the rebuilding of that city. And yet, there's this recognition that their ability to rebuild, their opportunity to be present in the holy city again, it's all a blessing from God. Though it's hard, though it's difficult, though there is struggle and tension between one another even, it's all slowly coming together. And they can't really make sense of how it's coming together based on how they're treating one another. But over time, sure enough, the city is turning into that promised place that God promised it would be. And so as they enter into this, they see the reality of it coming together and they get to receive the joy that comes in verses one or two and three. Take a look at this with me. It says, Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. You see, they're, they're filled with joy and recognition of God's hand on their life and what it is that he's done, and they're full of this laughter and dancing. It's this expressive worship of the satisfaction that God has given them as they see that he has upheld his promise, that he is still faithful to them, and their aim is to celebrate, to lift high the name of the Lord, and with expressive joy, with expressive worship, to just say, thank you, Lord, for the ways that you provide. And we get to do that today as well. This isn't just what they got to do. It's the life that we are living, that we get to see how God has provided for us, that time and time again, the Lord has aided and come alongside us. And so, for Israel, we see that it's so significant that in verse 3, excuse me, it's the end of verse 2, the nations around them, even their enemy nations, say, the Lord has done great things for them. The people who didn't even believe in God are saying, something's happening over there. And it's not those people because we've seen them behave. <laughs> This is something that the Lord must have done. This is something that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has drawn together. Now, let me paint the picture for you of what it is that they're celebrating and how the nations around them are seeing what God has done. They were in Babylon in exile for 70 years, and now they're coming back. But here's the thing. Their exit of Babylon is really the unexplainable because Babylon was the most fortified city. They had the largest army. They were masters of war. They were known for having what was referred to as a professional army, which was a rare occurrence. There were certainly nations that had military, but their military was comprised of some soldiers and lots of lay people. Babylon's army was a designated army. This was their job. This was their life. 
and they were training day after day. And they weren't just masters of war, they were masters of engineering. They had a great cavalry, uh, you know, I said that earlier too and I messed that up. Not uh, a great cavalry with many chariots and uh, more than that, they were masters of siege warfare. They knew how to build battering rams. They knew how to build siege towers that would allow them to easily and quickly overthrow cities. And so when we talk about their strength as a military power, what we see is it's vast and it is great. And just as their offensive ability is significant, their defensive was just as legendary, particularly their walls. We read about a Greek historian who lived shortly after the fall of Babylon. His name was Herodotus, and this is what he said in measuring the walls of the city, that the width, the, the depth of the wall was about 80 feet, and it got as high as 320. The wall was 56 miles around the city. And not only was there this massive wall that was impenetrable, but once you got past it, there was a second wall so that you were trapped in between the two if you made it past the first one. And some of the tactics of that day of war was if you can't beat them, if you can't you know, overcome the city, then starve them, cut off their water, cut off their access to their fields. But because the city was so well positioned, it had the Euphrates River running underneath the wall and they had farmlands within the city. There, there was no way to starve them out of the city. This was considered to be an impenetrable city. And you would have been thought of as crazy to think that they would one day fall to another nation, that they one day would not be able to defend themselves because you look at it and you think, man, this, if it was still standing, would be one of the wonders of the world today. Do you know how Babylon fell to Persia? It, it's one of those pieces in history that there's not a lot of great clarity around it. But here's the few small things that we know. From a great distance upstream, far enough away that they couldn't be recognized, they diverted the Euphrates River. And as the water got low enough and slow enough going under the walls, they were able to pry apart the gates and enter one after another into the city. And overnight, Babylon went from the most significant country in all the world, the most significant power in all the world, to defeated. That's a move of God. That's a move of God. That is what he is able to do. And what we find is that there wasn't bloodshed of Israel. Overnight, this empire didn't even have the opportunity to defend itself. And the unimaginable happened. Now, this didn't mean a lot for the Israelites at the time because they simply moved from being Babylonian captives to Persian captives. But perhaps some of them remembered God's promise in Isaiah 44, where he said, who says of Cyrus, naming the king of Persia, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. One chapter later, he says, I have stirred up Cyrus in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. You see, Babylon fell not because of the Persian creativity, the Persian strategy, the overwhelming force of their army. Babylon fell because 200 years beforehand, God made a promise. And we know that he is always faithful to fulfill his promises. So, using Isaiah, he revealed the very name of the king who would 200 years later take control of Babylon, and who would be known as a king who was there to restore displaced people. When you read the history books, that's what Cyrus is known for. 
I mean, how amazing is our God? How amazing that 200 years in advance, he has preset everything that's going to happen. He's told the people what's going to happen, and sure enough, the unimaginable happens overnight. You know, we see examples of this throughout Scripture, the ways that God is at work, and often we can't see the exact ways that he's at work until it's happened and we look back and we go, oh, wow, that was not me and that was not anyone around me. The Lord must have brought that about. And I want to encourage you to consider with me for a moment, if God is faithful like that to his people, if, if we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's going to uphold his promise, no matter how big it seems, how, how vast and beyond us it seems, how should that inspire us to live today? How should that inspire us to follow after him, knowing that he is faithful, knowing that he has made promises to us that we can claim, knowing that he provides every blessing and every provision in our lives. How should that embolden us for his name's sake as his people that he's invited into covenant relationship? I believe that one of the great challenges of the American church is that we're forgetting slowly how to praise and exalt God for what he's provided. I think the reason that we see less and less people being bold in their faith for the Lord is because as a society, we've learned more and more how to be independent, how to be self-sufficient. And the problem is, in our independence, we fail from time to time. We, we fall short. And sometimes we start repeating a mistake with another mistake. And then we begin to really struggle. And the problem is, because I've so learned to trust myself, and if I make mistakes, how can I trust those around me? How can I trust the Lord as I, as I enter into a place of true surrender before his throne. You see, it's almost as though we've become so independent that even in matters of faith, even in matters of ministry, we've come to think that we need to trust in our own ability instead of God's. And maybe that's not something that we consciously think. But I believe that we see it time and time again in how we live. And I just want to invite us this morning, can we agree together that there are ways for each one of us where we've learned to be self-sufficient that we need to repent before the Lord? Can, can we agree together to claim the promises of God that we want to aim to trust his character and enter into a format of prayer, a, a posture of prayer where we ask him to help us take bold steps of faith, trusting him. I think that's part of what it means to die to self. I think that's part of what it means to truly walk in a faith relationship with the Lord. You see, if we truly believe that he is faithful then we have to ask the question, what's holding me back from being emboldened? What's holding me back from being inspired by the fact that he's unchanging in character? He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What holds me back from entering into ministry knowing that the Holy Spirit lives in me? His very presence goes with me. I don't have to trust in my ability. I don't have to trust in what I know and what I understand. But I can enter into any form of ministry saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, please help me. And trust that he will provide. And I might not do it perfectly, but I need to build that relationship of trust, that habit of turning to God in this way. And so what we learn from these verses is that a habit of reflecting 
on God's generosity towards us actually frees us to embrace a lifestyle of generosity, gratitude, and bold faith. Now, we're going to pivot here a little bit because our author pivots here a little bit as we enter in to these next three verses. This is what he says in verses 4, 5, and 6. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negeb. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So we suddenly move from celebration, joy, laughter, dancing, this expressive worship of what God has done to a shift that's now focused on the provisions that we need today. It's this sense of, Lord, you have provided, but I still need you to provide. It's the reality of life. It's the tension that we face every day that we will never have enough, that we will always need more. It's the same as our spiritual condition before the Lord. We have been restored by God, but we are still being restored by God. We have been justified by the blood of Jesus, but we are still being sanctified. We're still being made holy by his blood. We've received forgiveness for our sin, and yet we still need to be forgiven for the sins that we're going to commit today. It's a reality of life, but what we know is that if we come before the Lord, he will forgive us. What we know is that he provides for his people and that he is consistent. And so in our times of suffering, in our times of need, we can boldly come before the throne and ask him to provide. And really as we look at this, as we consider these verses that led into four, five, and six. We see the Lord's provision, and we need to grab hold of that. We need to claim that because what it does is it emboldens us to take the steps of faith that we need today in order to surrender to him as we trust him for tomorrow. So in verse four, the author begins this prayer, and he's praying for abundant restoration. He says in verse four, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negeb. The Negeb is the desert. He's praying that the Lord would provide an oasis of vegetation in the midst of the desert. Why? Because they were gone from Israel for 70 years. They didn't have people who had crops ready for millions of people to come back. And what they're doing is they're planting these seeds. This is a food issue, an agricultural issue. They didn't have stores that they could go to. The land was laid waste. It was barren in so many respects. And so there's this need to have grain, to have seed. They're having to ration the food that they eat today so that they can plant food for tomorrow. But the problem is the very food that they're planting for tomorrow, they know they need today. It's this tension of sowing in tears because as I plant this seed, I know that I could eat this food and I'm so hungry. In between now and the harvest, the day of planting and the harvest of joy that comes, Lord, we need you to provide something for us. We need you to do a work here. And I think verse 5 and 6, they, they really help us to see what it means to celebrate in a time of need as well as being sure that we come before the Lord in whatever type of suffering or tension that we face. Tim Keller talks about these verses as a great metaphor, and it it helped me think about this quite a bit, but I think even more than it being a metaphor, I think we can pull a biblical principle out of these verses. And here's the principle. Sowing seeds in sorrow before the throne of God produces a harvest of joy. Sowing seeds in sorrow before the throne of God produces a harvest of joy. We so often think that joy will eventually follow sorrow, but it's more than that. It's that when we sow our sorrow appropriately, coming before the throne of God, bringing it to the Lord... 
He uses it to bring about sanctification in us. He teaches us how to be dependent instead of independent. I'm now inclined to seek after his ways, his power, his authority, rather than trying to control and fix it myself. And there's two ways that we need to think about this. The first is that we need to consider that there's a wrong way to sow. We said sowing seeds in sorrow before the throne of God produces a harvest of joy. But what if we find ourselves in times of sorrow and we don't go to the throne of God? What good comes out of suffering ordained by God when we resist coming into his presence? When we resist allowing it to teach us, allowing it to mold us, allowing to receive it as a gift. You see, we so often think as suffering is this tragic, hard thing. We rarely receive it as a gift from God where he's trying to show us how to lean into him in a new way. How to walk with him, how to depend on him in ways that we simply haven't in the past. And so maybe there's some good, maybe you're a little bit stronger coming through this sorrow, this time of suffering. But Keller says it would be like a farmer who goes out with his bag of seed and simply dumps it on the ground in one spot. It would be entirely inefficient, and your harvest is going to look like that inefficient approach. But what does it mean for us to sow good seed in our sorrow? What does it mean to come before the throne of God in this way? A way that actually produces joy in our lives later on. I think this is where we have to pivot and we have to look at the life of Jesus. I think this psalm actually is pointing to Jesus in ways that this author could have never comprehended. In Hebrews 12 too, it says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You see, Jesus went to the cross for the joy that laid on the other side of the suffering, for the joy that would come after enduring a time of sorrow, a time of suffering, a time of receiving my sin, my guilt, my shame, and placing it on himself. <laughs> he suffered more than any of us ever will because of taking the sin of the world and placing it on himself. And, and what we read in Scripture is that he never cried out, he never retorted with some type of smart comment, he never complained through the process. He simply endured the pain of the thorns being pressed into his head. He simply endured the rejection of the crowd as they spat on him and mocked him. He endured the agony and the suffering and the pain of the cross as he hung there to die. And he bore the weight of our guilt and our shame. What we see with Jesus is the night before the cross, that's when the suffering began. Three times over, he runs to the Father in prayer. Three times over, he is strengthened by the Lord by being intimate with him in coming to him again and again and again. You see, what we learn from Jesus in this is that the suffering is always worth it when we lean into it and we trust the Lord. The suffering is always something that God is doing a new work in us. And we see that powerful testimony through people like Johnny Erickson Tata, who had this paraplegic diagnosis when she turned 17 and how it radically transformed her life. You see, if Jesus is able to model sowing seeds of sorrow before the Lord in this way, maybe we ought to take a close look at the ways that we suffer. Sometimes I think we're tempted to suffer in guilt, that because I've offended God, this is happening to me. But when we look to the person of Jesus, we know he died for my sin. 
I don't have to suffer in guilt. Sometimes we're tempted to suffer in anger, in frustration, or in self-pity. But as we look to Jesus and we see how he patiently bore our sin, how he endured this type of pain and was able to move forward without a smart aleck comment, without some type of retort, maybe I can patiently endure what I'm going through by running to the Father. When we turn to Jesus in our suffering, it humbles us to a place of trusting God to provide what we need and being content with having nothing more than his presence. I think we so often forget that our relationship with God, first and foremost, starts with intimacy with him. And what our suffering does, if the seeds are sown rightly, is they bring us back before his throne again and again and again. We never know why it is that each of us face the challenges that the Lord gives us. But what we do know is that it's purposeful. It's not pointless. That he teaches us a deeper measure of faith through the challenges that he puts before us. So you see, in our suffering, in our unfulfilled longings, we're trained to be in his presence. We're trained to find peace. We're trained to find rest before his throne. And the tighter that we hang on to the things that we desire, the longer it takes us to learn that whether I get what I want or not, whether the outcome that I'm looking for happens or not, God is still faithful. He has still provided for me today, and he is still more valuable than anything else in this life. So perhaps one of the most practical ways that we can be humble in our times of suffering, that, that we can be intentional about sowing good seed, is to find ways to serve others even while we're suffering. You see, by doing this, we learn to care for people. We focus on encouraging them. And sometimes as we aim to encourage and build up those around us in our suffering, what we find is that our suffering is a little bit easier to handle because we're not so focused on myself. Instead, I'm focused on building up a brother, a sister in Christ. And what does it say to them to receive a phone call when they know that you're suffering, but you're just calling to say, hey, can I pray with you? Hey, I just, I just want to encourage you today. What's going on in your life? How can I... How can I be praying for you today? The principle here is that sowing seeds in sorrow before the throne of God produces a harvest of joy. We can learn far greater depth in our walk with the Lord that is far more enriching than anything that this world has to offer if we would just continually learn how to lean into him in our times of tension, in our times of suffering, if we would learn day after day how to seek intimacy over outcomes. So in this short six-verse passage, we have two important principles. First, a habit of reflecting on God's generosity towards us frees us to embrace a lifestyle of generosity, gratitude, and bold faith. And secondly, sowing seeds in sorrow before the throne of God will often produce a harvest of joy. What we see in Jesus is that he is the greatest servant in his suffering because his suffering provided for all of us. It's the great gift, the great ultimate provision that was made for everyone who would choose to receive him. And so anyone, no matter how far away you are from the Lord, can enter in to a faith relationship with him where you are forgiven for your sins and you can begin to know this deeper life of enrichment where you are freed from the pressures of this world and you can live in the freedom of Christ that brings you before the throne of God. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we thank you for this morning. And Lord, we, we thank you for the so many ways that you have provided for us again and again and again. That everything that we have is a blessing that has come from you. And so, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we lift up your name as the one that is worthy of worship. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be a people that always turns to you, that always seeks to have intimacy with you, that instead of coming to you with our problems, with our needs, with, with everything that's around us, that we would learn what it means to just strive after you. And that when we have the discomforts, when we have the tensions and the sorrow and the grief, Lord, we pray that those would be things that just drive us to your presence, that drive us to being healed by your hand. We commit ourselves to you in this way. In your name, amen.